Okay, hello students. This is our first guest poet. His name is Jesse Tovar, and I'm gonna give him a moment now to say something introductory before we bring on his poetry. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, hello, Don, and hello, USC uh, Upward Bound. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity uh, for uh, each of you to read my uh, poems. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you, Jesse, and uh, we'll get right to it. I'm gonna screen share your poems so everybody can see. And there we go, there's your first poem. If you'd like to read it or say whatever you like, go ahead. All right, so when I wrote this poem, I had a big shot by Kendrick Lamar and Travis Scott in mind from the Black Panther soundtrack. So I'm gonna try and raise my voice for this one. Raindrops, raindrops, broke ass window shops, soaked that wing stop, asked for a cup of pop, window shops at Old Navy, broke, broke ass camp ball, baby. Camp ball like a man, as she got her fans. Doesn't want to get soaked again, trapped in the pavilion. So for wow. this poem. Go ahead, go ahead, Jesse. Uh, for this uh, poem, um, what inspired me to write it is that there was one day I was at, so the pavilion is in, is uh, in reference to the South Bay Pavilion in Carson, where I was at uh, Cal State Dominguez House at the time for my uh, undergrad. Uh, before classes, I was reading some poems. I can't remember which poems I was reading for because I was taking another poetry class at around that time. And I was observing um, like a homeless guy that was just trying to, you know, like stay dry from the rain because it was a rainy day that day. And him just walking around asking for like a sample of like water and then him getting soda at Wingstop. So this is how this poem came to be. And I also wanted to emphasize rhyme since we were going over rhyme around like the time that this poem, that I formulated this poem. Well, yeah, this poem has a very tight rhyme. That's very good couplets. That makes it so catchy. Uh, it's such a, a joy to hear this poem out loud. And I really enjoyed the fact that this poem is a record of your visit to the pavilion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were also going over couplets. Oh my mm -hmm. God, now that I remember, we were all also going over couplets too on that day. Thank you for bringing up couplets. Yeah. Um, it just, uh, it's amazing how a short poem can say so much. This, uh, you're, you, it's image after image. Uh, just really well done. And some poets choose to punctuate, some don't. And what I like about you punctuating here by putting periods at the end of every line, it slows it down so that each image can be enjoyed by itself. Yes. Raindrops, raindrops, broke ass window shops, <laughs> soaked at wing stop, asked for a cup of pop. <laughs> Window shops at Old Navy. I won't be reading poems through all the way through, but this is a short one. Yeah. Okay, that's Camp Ball, baby. That's interesting. Camp Ball like a man at Sheik or Fans. Now, wh what is that? What are those? Uh, Sheik uh, or Fans. Those are uh, mm -hmm. two uh, shops that are located at malls. And those happen to be the two stores that are in this particular uh, mall <laughs> in Carson. I've also okay. seen them in other locations, I think in like the San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. What do, what do they sell at those shops? Uh, a bunch of like uh, mm. trendy shoes, like from Reebok, Nike, all the basketball, like trendy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just a wonderful first poem. Uh, I think the next poem is a little longer, huh? Let me get you the, your next poem. Okay. This one's in larger print and the title I'll let, you, I'll let you talk about it go ahead oh yeah so burned out of four arches uh this was published at the pen name newspaper la um in that newspaper i go by thomas till since they require everybody to go by like a fictional name and i wanted to write something that was inspired that was uh has a similar ring to autumn begins at martin's ferry ohio by james wright I was introduced to this poem by my, my good friend, Andrew Liu, uh, who was talking, because we were talking about like setting 
and like what you, oh, how much you can say about setting. So to try to mimic that effect, I just want to talk about like Fort Arches. So Fort Ar for those of you that don't know, Fort Arches is a sculpture that's in front of the Bank of America Tower in downtown LA around the intersection of Hope and Fort, I believe. Mm. Yeah. I think I've it's seen a, it. Yeah. And it's, and a lot of, lots of people take pictures of it. A lot of people, lots of people sit out there while, whether they're working there or just walking around downtown LA with their dog or just walking around in general or riding their bikes or skateboards. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. When I stare at the gateway facing the Bank of America Tower, I see highly paid bankers giving temps for assembly. Restless architects designing in the studio at Callison and exhausted custodians working graveyard at the tower, longing for more. The burned out proceed through four arches. They head to work, fund, a church, a dream career, a dead end job. They wish for change, a payoff. The result, they have sacrificially grown for others each and every July. And they pace towards another dull fiscal year. <laughs> All right. So this is another poem of place. And uh, again, you got your imagery, the visual details to take us there. And again, this poem is punctuated. Uh, this time it seems because it's the, the first stanza is really a sentence. Yes. Right, yeah, so that's how that's working. And the next sentence is the second stanza. And the third sentence is the third stanza, so it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, and assembly for those that don't know, since this is set in LA, um, assembly is the name of a church that's in the Eagle Rock area. And uh, Callison is actually one of the names of the architecture firms that are located within that um, tower. Actually, I think they're located below the tower because there's a lower level where you walk through and there's like a bunch of like little stores and even a Starbucks in there. And then the custodians are like for the people that, are, that clean up all that, like that area. Yeah. All right, so a question is forming in my head and that is that uh, in this poem, what's, what's your message in this poem? Uh, my message is that there are, um, I'm, I'm speaking to the people that just feel tired working, you know, long hours in, in this part of like downtown LA where there's a lot of like high business and a bunch of like critical work that has to get done for the development of like um, further development or for those that, um, that work there because they feel like they're, they're using their job as a purpose for a place of worship to like contribute to. You have answered my question 100%. Fantastic, Jesse. Let me ask you this. I also noticed that this one, uh, the lines are shorter. Is there a oh, reason that, the line, the lines are shorter? Uh, I believe it was just, just for like emphasis. So that way the reader can see, uh, just can focus like through four arches and then maybe they can perhaps they can think about that or like with assembly think about assembly like okay what's assembly and, and what is that place or if they know about assembly and they know maybe that it's christian assembly oh is he talking about christian assembly or or whatnot so you've created some interesting things here i'm gonna bring my background into this uh having studied poetry that when you wrote, uh, when I stare at the gateway facing the bank of America Tower, America Tower gets emphasized. So that's really mm -hmm. interesting, just like assembly. And then later on in that stanza, there's the tower. Mm -hmm. So that really gets emphasized. Um, and the second stanza is kind of more natural, a dead end job. That's, you know, yeah, yeah that's, that's a bite. Yeah. They wish for change, a payoff. Right. And for me, the most interesting, uh, I guess you would call this enjambment, is mm -hmm. at the very, uh, well, almost the whole stanza, you have, uh, it's, it's like in parts, 
They have sacrificially grown for others each and every July, and they pace towards another dull fiscal year. So it's pacing, it's literally pacing. I don't know if you intended that, but that's fantastic because yeah. it really gets that across. I'm sure you did intend it. Yeah. Because it's just by design. That's just an interesting thing. Also too, when I wrote this, I had visited this uh, particular sculpture like years ago in, I think it was 2014 uh, after work. I used to work at McDonald's in 2014 over on Central and Olympic. And I just mm -hmm. went there before I decided to ride the bus back home. And I was just thinking a, a lot about like what I want to do next in my life. It, Cause at the time I was also an architect major, but I already had a professor tell me like a few months before that, you know, I need to get this up that I'm not going to go nowhere with it. I don't, that he doesn't see me being a success in grad school. I mean, in when I transferred to a architecture school. So, and then also I was going to a church as well, not Christian assembly, but a different church altogether where I was like, do I even want to stay here anymore? Um, like I was already feeling unhappy there at that point. And if I still wanted to, you know, get a college degree, um, the next, I mean, I could have gone in, I could have gotten it in English, which I ended up getting a, a bachelor's degree in English at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And at least with that way, I can try and work on, you know, writing some nice, you know, some personal stuff while I'm learning, you know, more about writing and uh, other great authors from prose and poetry. And, so and I noticed also, your writing also has a social consciousness too, right? Yeah. It's like you're seeing for, it's like you have the eyes of society. And that's yeah. what brings me to your third poem because your third poem was my favorite. Uh... Oh yes, yeah. the one from Spectrum 25, yeah. Yeah, yeah so for this one, um, so, I, so in 20, from 2017 to 2019, I was working at a place called Classic Couriers. And there would be um, days where I would do a mail route for a TMZ, where they're located at Marina, I mean, at Playa del Rey. So I would head over to uh, their, UP, their PO box at the UPS office. I mean, at a UPS like store in like nearby and then head to their office. And, uh, you know, just pick up the mail, have it scanned at Warner Brothers Studios because like for the TMZ, they're still affili affiliated with AOL. That's how they started, which is owned by Warner Brothers. And then I would have to go back to TMZ to bring back the scan mail to make sure that it's not laced with anything like dangerous or whatnot. Wow. So, and long after, and then, you know, a year after I quit TM, I mean, um, Classic Couriers, um, I still go through, you know, visit TMZ every now and then. And then I read an article about um, this uh, sports announcer uh, saying something unaware uh, before the Cardinals game. And this is how this uh, poem came to be. Marginalization in MLB. I'll go ahead and read it. Dwayne, wearing a number 67 Cardinals jersey, admits he finally understands marginalization. You'd think he knows thanks to racist pieces of shits spewing hate in MLB. While on his phone at Walmart in Ferguson, marginalization, the definition, the concept, the act became alive in his head when Matt Bauman apologized to his LGBTQ community, quote, for the way, end quote, Tom Bregman, quote, marginalized, end quote, them on national television. Better late than never, Dwayne. There's room for all black lives in MLB, the very, very, very toxic Christian sport. There's room for everyone in MLB. Yeah. I was listening to the applause here. That was really good. <laughs> yeah. I heard some. I don't know. Maybe it's in my head. <laughs> well, so this poem, this poem goes a step farther. You're not just observing but you're also offering a point of view. Yes. And that's what I love about this poem. This is a, this is a poem that is it's a political statement. It has something to say that is a message that needs to be delivered. And a poetry is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. This poem is an example of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, has, would... Oh, 
<laughs> Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, with this poem too, I wrote it after I had read a few poems and prose poems that I've read for an, a, for an event series called Black Poets Matter by a Man Mouth Poetry. Hmm. So um, that is, this is, that's also, I guess, like a catalyst for, or at least, I guess, uh, an aftermath of me being part of that to write this as well. So yeah, for Black I'll, Post, well, go ahead, go ahead. So for Black Post Matter, it was a series over the summer and early fall where posts would come and, you know, read, you know, what the BLM movement meant to them what social injustice meant to them because we all know what happened during the summer and it's not because it's senseless i mean how can anyone say to say that it's senseless like what happened with these protests and these riots there was um again like as uh, bradley no one sublime says about these after situations and these after police and your style really complements this message because it's so visual, you're, you're not just telling people, you're showing them, mm -hmm. right? So you've got yeah. uh, the first stanza showing the jersey. And uh, then I love the third stanza even, where it says, while on his phone at Walmart in Ferguson, that really pins the place. And then finally, at the very end here, uh, when you bring in um, Dwayne, not Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne is just um, just a person that represents an average citizen in Ferguson, Missouri. Because mm -hmm. as we know, there was also police involved shootings that happened in Ferguson, Missouri back in 2013. And even most recently, like in, um, what was that other city in Missouri? Or darn, I, I, I'm already blanking. Ferguson's the famous one. Yeah. For, Kenosha. There you go. Kenosha. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else here? Anything else? Um, so I'm, I just, your format just fits it so well. It makes it uh, enjoyable to read. It has the emphasis, your your choices to isolate things, right? Like understands marginalization, spewing hate in MLB, and the definition, the concept, the act, that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, and the very, 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 you have the third very, which I didn't expect, which is what made it so good. And it, it's emphasizing the situation uh, yeah, just great job of writing. And we've come to the point now where I'm going to ask you the famous three questions. I'm going to pretend I'm a student because I can't have the students here with me. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this a long time, so I've heard many student questions over the years. And so I'm going to try to ask you the famous <laughs> three questions that students All ask. Right. Okay, so you're ready? Here we go. Question number one, why do you write poetry? So I write poetry because it's one of the quickest forms of writing that is something you can write when you feel like you want to write when you write when you want to write about something in response to like what's going on in the world or what you see in the news so that's why i write poetry uh also what start uh what sparked an interest in me writing poetry especially like in that fashion is for me taking a poetry class at uh, east la college uh it was taught by stanley oropesa who um from pasadena and in that class, in addition to us reading, you know, about po uh, poets that are often anthologized, uh, we also had a chance to, you know, write our write poems of our own. And from there, that stuck with me to just like, hey, I can use this as an outlet for me to write like what the news is saying, what the mainstream is saying. Okay, question number two. Let's see if I remember my questions now. Uh, the first one was, why do you write poetry? Was that the first one? The first one was... Am I, getting, yeah, am I, am I on track here? Because the I, other I, thing I, I hear them say I'm not, is, is they ask, uh, kind of like, do you uh, enjoy being a poet? 
You know what? As a poet, I enjoy it, even though um, I have said that I don't consider myself a poet because um, I still feel like I have a lot more to learn. Even though I have poetry that hasn't published, I still feel like I have a lot more to learn. And like, for example, with the Burned Out for Archers, I did like a poet uh, mimicking of uh, James Wright's poem about, about a city in Ohio. So mm-hmm. I try to like see what I can write for myself inspired by other poems that I come across. Yeah. And uh, the third question, this is more of a teacher question than a student question. That is, uh, what advice would you give to young writers? Uh, any advice? Okay. So um, what I would tell a young writer is, um, is um, whatever you read, whether it's prose or poetry, just try and spend some time. Um, it's maybe after the class is done, to like pay attention to like why it's written, how it's structured, and see if you can um, what you can do uh, to write something of your own from there. That's good advice. That's good mm-hmm. advice. Poems can inspire you to write poems. Yes, it's so true. So true. If I if I haven't got any ideas, I just start reading some poems. Yeah. Yeah, and the light goes on. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. This ends your segment. I appreciate you visiting my class virtually. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, since I have another poet here with me, uh, we're going to try to do two poets in this single recording. This is Coco. Hey, Coco. <laughs> and I believe I have your poems here. I'm going to hunt for them right now. Hi, everyone. Ellen, if you want to say anything introductory, Coco, go ahead. Go ahead. My name is Coco. <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. I am a uh, poet with Spectrum Publishing. Um, I found Don King Fisher Campbell um, when I was in the midst of battling um, my severe mental wellness issues. I have um, chronic post traumatic stress disorder. So if you've heard of PTSD, it's PTSD times a thousand. So I actually I actually graduated <laughs> in my mental wellness issues. And that's when Don found me. Um, when I was really at my lowest point. And um, it's been an honor working with him and being a part of Spectrum. And I hope you enjoy. The poetry that you're hearing from from all these fabulous poets it's amazing that the reach that this man has <laughs> thanks coco you know you made quite an impression too you you came onto the scene and no one could deny that you had something to say you have very powerful poetry and you're going to be sharing three of your poems and it's possible that one of these students is going to choose to write about this poem who knows yeah. First, they gotta hear it, right? Did you want to say anything to introduce this poem and go ahead and read? Yeah, this is kind of um, my introduction to poets and you know how they know who I am. Um, I'm very popular in the poetry community for this particular piece. Is a poetry fan favorite. <laughs> um, this is "Would You Notice Me." If I hung myself from a tree in front of where you live, would you notice me? Eyes bulging, feet twitching like a fish out of water, or would the electricity of my cut live wire electrify you in guilt? What if I drown myself in your pool, floating on the water like a buoy bobbing gratuitously, or would you just skim me out of the pool of your life? Maybe if I blew my brains out in your office, you would notice me there. Splattered against the wall, like the spaghetti dinner you threw indignantly, angry at the mere insolence of my existence and pretentious dreams of acceptance. A swan dive from a tall building or a suicide bridge is just too cliche. 
I'm not looking for a captive audience to talk me down. This isn't a cry for attention or premeditated pretense. I can swallow all my medications in one big gulp. Chase my opioid-filled happiness with sedated peace. Staggered steps, chasing breaths, foaming bubbles of rabid sadness, perhaps slitting my throat would best capture your attention. A Merlot-colored waterfall from my smiling flesh. Pooled memories flood the floor of manic depression. How about if I clothed myself in plastic explosives? I am the first of four girls, conveniently all named for the scene. Would you help me push the button to purge my soul from the tyranny of words? My confetti parts decorate everything within a three mile radius. What do you see in low shaft images along the wall? A work of art by Paul Jackson Pollock, perhaps? I think I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, my, fav a... my favorite lines are the last stanzas, the last two stanzas. <laughs> Everyone likes that part. Well, it's quite an image. I mean, uh, just like uh, Jesse Tovar, images do the work. Mm -hmm. This is uh, just a. Uh, it makes me think of a term that old people use, gangbusters. <laughs> my, professor, my professor at Cal State LA back when I went there in the 80s, he says, oh, that's gangbusters. You know? Nobody uses that term nowadays, but uh, that's what this poem is, definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, this was written in real time. This was not edited at all. I didn't workshop it, none of that. Very personal. This is exactly how I felt in the moment when I wrote that. So I wrote it in, in real time. Yeah, and, and it's uh, three line stanzas. I think those are called tercets. Uh, that just seems to be the natural way it goes. You go from one thing to the next, they all take up that space. So you did you consciously choose to make them take similar spaces? I did. It's like- That's exactly how I, um, exactly how I wrote it. <laughs> The form of the poem came to you because that's the way it was going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, this thought and then this thought and then this thought and, and it just it, actually it went out that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens to me too. I think it happens to every writer. Uh, yeah, once you get that knack for writing, you know, it's kind of hard to like not. <laughs> and then comes that last line all by itself. Statement piece, statement piece, yeah. It's a great dramatic pause there, right? You got mm -hmm. everything going, 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 and then cut the lights. <laughs> How subtle, yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we're ready to go to your next poem then. Uh, I could spend a lot of time with these poems, but I, I'm you. only given so much time. So here's the next one. Go ahead and introduce. Oh, yes. The Colors of Trauma by Coco. Yes. Um, Again, I struggle a lot with mental wellness. So a lot of what I write about is uh, mental wellness driven. And all of my poems are like slap you in your face kind of writing. Um, so yes, <laughs> the colors of trauma. Happiness is a color palette that my brush refuses to pick up. My canvas of epiphany and strife have only ever allowed the cold dark dust of charcoal on a white surface. I have lived my life in the shadows amidst grief and forlorn solitude, built skyscrapers made from distrust that tower to the heavens, only to shake my fists in envy at its beauty. I damn myself to hell and walk hand in hand, holding unrelenting anger. A kind that turns fireflies into arsonists burning down the rainforest. My inner joker laughs and giggles at the thoughts of punishment and pain. Ooh. 
My damnation is my own doing. Suffering is the same, but I am a blind or all looking into an orb with self-pity and loathing. I am no deity, no savior or salvation to be worshipped. This blue flame of vengeance dances so elegantly in my mind. Lustful thoughts of suicidal and homicidal bliss sing harmonies of peace. Everlasting justice delivered in a smiling box by his doorstep. That I could be the fly on a wall that witnesses his kaleidoscope of terror. My paintbrush finally has color and my canvas has changed from white to red. I'm sensing a theme here. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, poems about my aggressor. Poems about yeah, my aggressor. I was just gonna say, is this is this what they call suicidal ideation? Yes, it is actually, yeah. and that is a real thing, and it is something that uh, people struggle with. And I've been hospitalized for suicidal ideation more times than I can remember. <laughs> and it doesn't really it help home, yeah. much, but you know. I was just going to ask, does this, does this help? Writing, writing helps. The writing helps, the being locked up where you're just isolated further and you have nothing but a hospital gown, that doesn't help. <laughs> and another thing I noticed too is this, this seems to be empowering. It is, right? it is. It's very like, I, when I write, as I feel all that, I feel all of what I'm writing. And then when I get it out on the page, I can breathe a little easier after that. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I'll say- Writing is my salvation. <laughs> time is so of the essence, but I'll say one more thing. A part of the fun, can I even say that? Of a poem, of your poetry is you have these details like my inner joker, laughs and giggles and mm -hmm. thoughts of punishment and pain, wow. Wow, that did line, that line just floored me. My and favorite one, line, in this one, my favorite one is his kaleidoscope of terror. That's my favorite line. It's like you knew where, where things were going to go. It starts happiness is a color palette that my brush refuses to pick up. Wow, I mean that just opens the door from the get go. And then you have the extremely powerful last line. My paintbrush finally has color and my canvas has changed from white to red. I think everybody knows what you're saying. <laughs> I blew his butt up. <laughs> yeah, so we, know, we will now tread, bracing ourselves for the third and final poem. <laughs> this one is fun. I love this one. So, uh, you know, Jesse was talking a lot about the injustices of what happened over the summer and just injustice, injustice as a whole. And um, this came about during that time, you know, during George Floyd. And I was working with, um, I was working with a, a college campus and the advisor that I was working with, like there were some things that happened and I, I really felt like the, the, I felt the wall of like, you're on this side of the fence and I'm on that side of the fence. And mm -hmm. let me tell you why I don't need you to edit me right now. <laughs> and that's where this poem came about was me saying, um, how about you stop for a minute? <laughs> and let me tell you why. I ain't your colored excuse crayon lines. I'm not a fence to be whitewashed or painted over. I don't need you to insert your image of what you think is acceptable for white eyes. I won't sit in the back within your oppression bus. I have no desire to eat your strange fruit plucked words. I know your sly way words that slip down oiled racism progress. I wonder what your stale bread thoughts taste like. I rage. 
My volcano erupts truths. Magma cools that you collect in your pocket. I will not be your possession, your chess piece, your trophy of solidarity. I see you. Your privilege illuminates your actions brighter than your lasers aimed at my existence. Wow. <sighs> They're very cathartic. Your poems are very cathartic. <laughs> my poems are very angry. <laughs> I feel such release. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if you have other poems that aren't aren't as angry, but they are still, you know, very. I do. I paint a picture. I paint a picture of exactly what I'm thinking and exactly what I'm going through, and I paint it all out with words. That's basically what well, I do. I've, I've just got to highlight again some of my favorite parts because I mean, this for to, for from the get go, it has an interesting title. And then it says uh, oppression bus, which is such an interesting image mm -hmm. because it's not just visual, it's also emotional, mm -hmm. right? Combined in the same image. So that's just remarkable. And uh, historic, historic reference. Mm -hmm. Strange fruit, plucked words, strange fruit, there's a historical allusion there. Yep. To a song. I got to say that for the young people. I know, right? Billy Holiday. Yeah. Learn your and, uh, <laughs> Stale bread thoughts, which to me harkens back to that color white. Stale Wonder bread. It makes, bread. Yeah. makes me think of Wonder Bread, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I was intentional. Yeah. Oh. oh my goodness. You know, and the the one that a lot of people don't get though is the um. Hmm. The magma and the, uh, the, you know, like the tar, they used to call, you know, there was a, a, a racism, you know, tar babies. So, you know, that's, that's that reference right there. A lot of people don't get that. The shards of magma. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, we're into the question portion. We've only got three minutes left. Uh, I think I'm doing my math. Maybe it's eight minutes. Uh, it's supposed to be a 45 minute recording and I think we started at 1230. What time is it? Uh, I'm not it a perfect- It's 108. Yes, 108, yeah. So that means we have two minutes or, or seven minutes. We'll say seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 45. I hope, I hope it's right. Within five minutes here, okay. okay. But uh, right away, I'm starting to feel inside what would the students be asking you and and the first thing that comes out of it is uh, i know you currently live in pasadena I do. but are you from pasadena or are you from somewhere else i grew up in eagle rock <laughs> eagle rock i am jesse yes eagle rock is a little town um in between in between glen hill and pasadena and highland park is right there next to it it's me <laughs> If you grew up in LA, you know these references. But um, yeah, I've always been uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, so didn't move very far. <laughs> well, then I'm going to ask another obvious question, the one that I ask every poet, and that is, what does poetry do for you? Keeps me living. Poetry wow. keeps me living. Read more books. If it were not for the written word and being able to write, I don't know where I would be right now. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to the last question that I always ask, and that is, uh, what advice would you give a, a young writer? Read more books. <laughs> there are- uh, Read books or what? I mean, read, I already... more, read more books, yes, period. Um, read poetry books, read literary classics, read whatever you can get your hands on. Um, if you want to improve, your style of writing or find your style of writing. So, because some people think that, oh, well, you know, I'm not a writer. I don't write this way. I don't write in that format. There are so many, I love to say, so many different flavors. Try them all. 
try them all. And the best way to learn all these flavors is, is this man right here, this John Kingfisher Campbell. Ooh, 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 he, he, he is the one to learn this from. Take very, very distinct notes. Like very, attend the workshops if you can. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> he makes it look easy. He makes it look easy, but yeah. Thanks for the plug. Thanks for the plug. Uh, yeah, our workshops are every Saturday at three. So if you ever have free time on a Saturday at three, you just uh, Google Saturday afternoon poetry and it'll lead you to us. Yep. But uh, I was going to say, uh, I always thought of myself as a poet more like Jesse Tovar, you know, I, I like to be subtle, understated, uh, but. No, I like I to, to admit, No, I have to admit inside, you know, I want to be Coco. <laughs> oh. Because, because uh, you're just so powerful. I want my poetry to be, to be that powerful. I mean, it's, that is Your just poetry a, is still so huge. Yeah. All right, I want you guys to know this. I have a Don King Fisher Campbell collection of poetry. I have collected most of his works. <laughs> no, and, um, all oh, of his works. No, but, go ahead, Jesse, it's okay. Yeah, it's go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and also I watched a recent episode of Joshua Corwin's Assiduous Dust for his on the spot collaborative poem. Mm. And he used the one of your poems uh, for the collaborative poem with his guest um, in one episode that I watched on YouTube for his on his um, for his podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joshua Corwin, I helped birth that child. So <laughs> when he was a very young poet, Don and I both. Endless hours helping Joshua get to where yeah, he is right now. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's on his own. Okay. And now he's but, on his own. Uh, we're now definitely he's a three minutes right to go. Three minutes to go. So I got to wrap up. Um, I think I've asked no, you. But what I'm saying is, you can be oh. understated and still have powerful poetry. That's my point. You can still be understated and have powerful poetry. You can write fun poems that you think are irrelevant to anything. And that can be like a pushcart nominated poem. You know, I still think that like every household needs to have 13 ways of looking at little chocolate donuts. <laughs> That's another poem, yeah. <laughs> that See, needs to be a poster. You know, that, you know what that poem is? I mean, uh, I like to think and I know this is true for Jesse's poetry, we're documenting our lives. We're documenting what we experience. That's what I love about Jesse's poetry. And your poetry is doing that too, but uh, on an even greater level, I would say, uh, in the sense that uh, you bring so much uh, of yourself. I, I vomit the whole thing out. <laughs> yeah, that, that to me, that that is, that is, uh, that's uh, something for us all to aspire to, to, uh -huh. to use our writing, to, to bring out and, and heal ourselves, right? Bring it out and heal. Yeah, yeah. So I thank you so much. That's now, just a note to, uh, thank you, uh, Jesse and Coco. I wanted to make a note to the students. Remember, uh, there's an assignment associated with this recording. So after you watch this recording, uh, be sure to fill out the assignment, uh, essentially, you're just saying why you in, enjoyed it and giving some specifics. So be sure to do that to get credit for having watched this recording. And thanks again. We've got to uh, say goodbye. This is the end of episode one. How do we shut off? How do we shut off? Leave. <laughs> shut off the recording. I have to do it, huh? I have yeah. To do it. All right. Stop recording. Here we go.